All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Today with us, we have a stellar guest. And not only this, that he is very accomplished, the importance of his presence today is that he is an expert in chronic diseases. He just wrote a book for the chronic diseases. We'll ask him about that book as well as we talk about it. And the time is right to talk about COVID long haulers. Time is right to talk about Lyme and then so many other chronic diseases that we are going through at this time. And as he sometimes puts it, the pandemic of the chronic infections. So for that, we have with us Dr. Stephen Phillips. His introduction is the following. He is a renowned Yale trained, Yale trained physician, author, international lecturer, and a media go-to expert. Well published in the medical literature, he has treated over 20,000 patients with complex chronic illnesses from nearly 20 countries. Dr. Phillips experienced firsthand, so this is important that he himself actually went through some of these issues. He experienced firsthand the nightmare of undiagnosed, undiagnosed, serious infections after nearly dying from his own mystery illness and having to save his own life when 25 doctors could not. His own story, his part of the, uh, the story that he, uh, he talks about and then the, um, uh, the offer that he has the help, is part of that he helped himself. He helped, uh, I think his, uh, his father is part of the story as well. So we are going to ask all those questions from him. We're gonna ask him about his book. We're gonna ask him about his own work. And then finally, COVID and other chronic diseases. So join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Phillips. Welcome Dr. Phillips. Thank you so much. That is some introduction. It was so hard to listen to in terms of being like a little cringeworthy because it was too complimentary, but thank you. It's very flattering. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I started practice in 1996 and my practice focus has been galvanized on chronic illnesses because my dad had uh, a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy, which was going on for about 20 years. And we took him to the best cardiologists in New York City. Uh, his cardiologists were the president's cardiologists and the presidents at the time. And um, they couldn't they couldn't help. And they wanted to give him a heart transplant. He had a few months to live, they said, without a heart transplant. And I was finishing up residency at the time. I was doing research in microbiology and immunology of uh, Buberdorferi, the Lyme bacteria, as well as ehrlichiosis. And I had learned that Lyme can cause dilated cardiomyopathy. So I talked to my dad's cardiologist. I said, holy moly, you know, before going to a heart transplant, we should at least evaluate him for Lyme. And he basically looked at me like I was crazy and wouldn't even check him. He said, he doesn't have Bell's palsy, he doesn't have arthritis, it's not Lyme. And here we are living in a Lyme endemic area and every other house basically has a case of Lyme. So he's like, if you wanna do it, you do it yourself. You're a doctor now. And I did, and I checked him for Lyme. His test was negative. So I was like, okay, which, you know, I looked at it from a risk benefit analysis. Before I went to med school, I went to a business program at University of Pennsylvania at the Wharton School. And it's all about risk benefit analysis. Then when we become doctors, it's all about reading guidelines. And I didn't really care what the guidelines said about Lyme. I didn't, I, I just cared about my dad surviving. And if, you know, I took three years of doxycycline when I was a kid for acne and it's a relatively safe drug. And it's a hell of a lot safer than heart transplant. So I gave him some doxy and he responded. He had what's called a Herxheim reaction where she got worse and they started feeling better. And to make a long story short, within a year, his heart function normalized and he never needed a heart transplant. He's 88 years old. And um, that was a long time ago. So that's what put me on the path and really like set it for me. But my own illness, this is a weird story, but I was already focusing on chronic illness from chronic infection. And that's what I was doing and trying to determine. And Lyme is the one that gets everybody's attention, but there are many others. And in my sleep, I got spider bites. And I didn't think anything of it because we're not thought to treat spider bites with antibiotics or worry about them in any way. Within a couple of months, I had a rapidly progressive arthritis of my spine and all over. I ended up getting systemically ill, getting very, very anemic. My hematocrit was 25. My um, weight plummeted. I lost 50 pounds in a matter of months. I uh, 
had an enlarged spleen. I started getting fevers, 102 every night. And within six months, I couldn't take a single step on my own. I couldn't walk for the following two years. I gave up my practice. I was completely bed bound. Everyone thought I was gonna die, myself included. And I required 24 hour home care. I couldn't turn over in bed. I couldn't sit up on my own. I couldn't lift my arms against gravity. And it was utterly hopeless. And I came back from that by figuring it all out in the last minute and saved myself. And when I came back to practice, I just was minding my own business. And Dana Parrish walked in one day and uh, she's a, uh, said, you know, once I got her better, she's like, you have to, we have to do something about this. We have to kind of change things. And um, then we set out on a mission together to, to write this book. Excellent. Thank you very much. So what a story, what a story for your father that they're going for heart transplant and then no need for the heart transplant. And what a story for your own self as well. So for the cool beans over here, uh, Dr. Phillips, if you don't mind, I'm just going to very quickly uh, show them the book that is displayed behind you as well. So uh, cool beans here. Uh, here is the, of course, Dr. Bean's site that is customary to look at. And I wanted to show us the book. So this is the book, Chronic, The Hidden Cause of the Autoimmune Pandemic and How to Get Healthy Again. And if you see here, Dr. Stephen Phillips, MD, and Dana Parrish with Kristen Loberg. And here there is a glowing, um, <laughs> there is a glowing comment from Dr. Sanjay Gupta as well. So this is fascinating. And if you, uh, if I just scroll over a few pages over here, you would actually see that I have uh, gone over the whole book. It is such a uh, treasure of information, not only for the doctors and healthcare professionals, but for common people as well. So if I could request you to buy one book, so remember, I've not, not been asking you to buy books. If I could request you to buy one book, that would be this book. And I have been going over this, as you can see, I've, I've been highlighting various parts of it and I've been uh, learning from this uh, book as well. So this is one book. Then there are some more things. Uh, I would I have the link to this uh, op-ed as well by Dr. Phillips here in the uh, NBC. So please make sure that you can give it a look as well. So with this, um, so Dr. Phillips, can you tell me a little bit about the book? What, what do you cover in there? What is interesting about it? And um, why should people have it? Well, I mean, I think that the infection that gets the headlines is always Lyme. You know, Lyme is on everybody. It's the forefront of our consciousness. It's common. Everyone knows somebody with Lyme. But there are so many other infections. The infection that got me, the infection that caused these horrible autoimmune diseases, in my case, was not Lyme. I had had Lyme before, don't get me wrong. I got Lyme uh, some time after med school and it wasn't pleasant. I'm not gonna minimize or maximize. I don't overstate or understate. It was a crappy, crappy illness, but it didn't disable me and I was able to get through it. Lyme is very common. In some cases it can you know, be very mild. In other cases it can literally kill people. In many cases it can disable. And you find this heterogeneity across virtually all of these infections. It's the same thing with Bartonella, Brucella, it's the same thing with tuberculosis. I mean, there's no uh, stereotype that really sums up what these infections can do because they span the spectrum to living with them with no symptoms whatsoever to disabling and or deadly illness. And that's very, very hard for doctors to get their heads around. So of course we start with Lyme because that's the one that everyone knows about. And then we branch off onto this enormous range of other bacterial infections. We go down the path of parasitic infections, of viral infections, and briefly uh, touch upon some fungal things. Got it. So so while uh, you were discussing, I'm just showing the audience your book as well on Amazon. So Cool Beans, just give me one second. I'm going to actually, uh, the link to this book is in the description of this video. Plus, I'm going to put it in the comments here as well, just for your ease. So, uh, sorry. 
Well, Let's thank you so much. This is extremely nice of you. And I also want to make an offer to your viewers. If they ever want to do another video in a month from now, kind of like a book club, you know, if you if you want, we didn't discuss this before, but I'd be happy, happy, happy to come back and address any questions that people have in the book. I've already had <laughs> my initial book club with my 88 year old mother who it took her about three months to get through the book and we meet and she just wants to know every little detail about every infection known to man. She's adorable and now knows most knows more about weird infections than most doctors that I know, fortunately or unfortunately. Excellent. So that is very generous of you that you can come back. So cool beans, please remember if you would like that we request Dr. Philipson's more after you have re read the book and you have questions and you want to discuss parts of it, please um, let me know and we would request uh, Dr. Phillips to come back. So uh, now getting into the weeds of the <laughs> of the discussion. So let's start from this. Uh, I want to talk about COVID and some part of Lyme and some more diseases as well, as much time as we can get. So tell me this, uh, how do we start? Should we talk about the role of the immune system in chronic diseases? What are the chronic diseases? What is the role of immune system in there? Right. Uh, what happens? Right. So the, the real question, I mean, autoimmune disease is kind of a gray area. I mean, I think that doctors all know this, but no one really says it out loud. They don't say these terms. You know, I went to three rheumatologists. I had a rheumatologist hold my hand and tell me the embryo would be the cure for me. And I was like, okay, but what are we treating? And she said, well, we as rheumatologists don't focus on cause, we focus on effect. And if we can suppress your symptoms for the rest of your life, then that's a cure. And I said, I understand what you're saying. I'm not trying to be argumentative. However, let's just say what it is. It's really palliation. And you're not getting at the underlying the root cause. And the book is all about delving into and trying to find the root cause of various conditions. So in terms of autoimmunity, there are innumerable infections that cause autoimmune markers, rheumatoid factors and ANAs and depression and complement and immune complex elevations. These are common features. And I always use the expression that nature is not fickle, that it finds a recurring theme. You know, I always I also use an example of, I have a patient who, or had a patient, she wasn't really a patient, she was way on the waiting list. The waiting list was always long to see me. And I had a patient who was trying to get in because she had erythema nodosum, a rash on her leg, nodular rash, and both Lyme and Bartonella are published to be able to cause that. And that's why she was on my list to be seen. And then she canceled her appointment. And my secretary, you know, as she does, she just called to see if everything was okay, to apologize for the wait list, blah, blah, blah. And if it was emergent, I can come in on a Saturday or something, you know, like that. So she said, no, no, they did a biopsy of the rash and it was tuberculosis. So here you have, you know, multiple infections that all result in the same inflammatory pathway. There's only, there's only so many paths that the body can take in terms of inflammation and many infections can go down these very same pathways. So I don't think that the net diagnosis of, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or chronic fatigue syndrome points to any one infection. I think that viewers have to realize, and I, I, I've realized this for a while, but then personally, I realized that the very hardest of ways is that an autoimmune diagnosis is a label, it's a description. It's not telling you what you have. It's not like, oh, we found out you have a broken leg and that's why you can't walk. No doctor found out why I couldn't walk. Nobody could tell me what was going on with me. And it was really a, a chance, just a chance event that I was able to make the diagnosis myself. Got it, got it. So um, uh, I read in your book at one point, staying on the topic of the immune system, autoimmunity. Um, you talked about T helper one cells and T helper two cells. Interestingly, the cool beans here, the group that we are, we have been talking about T helper one and two for about a year now. We've talk, been talking about innate arm and the acquired arm. So majority of the cool beans here are actually very comfortable with these discussions in detail as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if you will, uh, can you please tell us uh, what happened? So here is the big question. Let's say COVID, SARS-CoV-2 arrives in our body, then we become a long hauler. Is it the COVID hiding somewhere? Is it the T helper one cells or two cells or innate arm or adaptive arm? What has happened? What, what are the possible hypotheses for what went wrong? 
People, that's a good question. I, I think that to approach complex problems, to try and unravel them, you have to go into it like we're a three-year-old. You know, just look at it as a child would, would ask the question why. When patients get diagnosed with inflammatory conditions, no one really stops to ask those very good questions like why. They just give them the immune suppressants. I think that in my mind, it could be grouped into three likely categories of what's causing long COVID, and they're the ones that make the most sense to me. And the fourth category, we'll just touch on also. First category, category number one, patients who had significant illness and had a lot of vascular injury, and they're just taking a long time to heal. And that's easy for everybody to get their heads around. These people are just going to heal very slowly because the endothelium, the lining of blood vessels, heals notoriously slowly. There are actually really some con common sense tips that people can do for that. Some, you know, things that are every day, mild exercise, the phytochemicals that are in cacao and tea are known to stimulate stem cells and migrate from the, the marrow and to, to regenerate the endothelium. So that's, you know, just a, a lot of time and letting the body heal if the infection is gone. If the infection is not gone, that's a different story. So in category number two, let's say you have patients, actually categories number two and three, you have patients where they may not have had a really bad case of COVID to begin with. Some of them have had mild cases, or if they had a significant case, they recovered fully. Then three to four months later, they start feeling poorly again. So that model of, you know, slow to heal injury, there's no way does that fit with those patients. And in those patients, it looks like there's an infection going on, or is it just a perturbation of the immune response? So there is accumulating data that SARS-CoV-2 can persist in the body. You know, there's data from GI biopsies and data within the spleen and, you know, all the way up in the olfactory bulb. And, you know, these are not routine tests that people go for when you go for your regular nasal pharyngeal swab. So the your doctors are not going to be able to, outside of research setting, you're not going to be able to diagnose people with persistent infection with the virus. However, what I'm struck by is that long COVID patients are not being offered the same early, effective, safe, and cheap uh, medications that are used in early COVID. And I think that's where a lot of the research should should be should be centered. I only have one one long COVID patient right now, and she's a patient who I didn't have the opportunity to treat early on, and she didn't know that I would be interested or, you know, whatever. And she didn't call me. I found out months later when she was having chest pain with breathing and she was calling all her doctors and I was one of the many doctors that she called out of desperation and I gave ivermectin and she responded within 24 hours and then she was good for three months relapsed again I gave ivermectin again and again responded within 24 hours so I do think that it's probable that in some subset of patients the virus is persisting then the question is can there be persistent autoimmune dysregulation that happens in the absence of active infection. I mean, this is the whole premise of the book, that most likely that's not the case. The body has so many nice feedback loops to downregulate an autoimmune response. And I just don't see it happening in the absence of continued antigenic stimuli. So that's my personal opinion. Can it ever happen? You know, ever or never, all or none. These are such big words I would never presume to know. But I would say, I could tell you from the other patients that I've seen that have been diagnosed with autoimmune conditions by their doctors who would swear in a stack of Bibles that they have a autoimmune self perpetuating, you know, inflammatory condition without any infectious, you know, link, the vast majority get better under my care. And, and I was one of them. So just based from what I've seen, I would say most, we're talking high 90s percent, uh, resolve their illness with antimicrobial therapy. Got it. Thank you very much. This is actually, if and as you said, this is this is some. I think as you alluded to that this is a evolving situation as well. Is it really the immune system dysregulated? Is it the virus hiding somewhere? It is interesting to see that you have had uh, success with ivermectin as well. I've been using ivermectin. I've been using steroid pulses as well. I want to uh, to the cool beans. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Phillips. During these discussions, I I want to show them your work as well. So. Sure. To the cool beans, I want to show Dr. Phillips's book once more, but this time I want to show the chapter. And thank you very much for sending me these books and chapters. So here is a chapter number nine that is on COVID. 
and COVID long haul. So again, um, I don't want to go over all of this because it is copyrighted material. Mm -hmm. But important thing, once again, is that this is something that uh, Dr. Phillips has discussed and talked about, and it is present in the uh, in the literature as well. So as we we're writing, we we're finishing up the book last year, and here we had just written a book about chronic autoimmune neurologic and psychiatric illness related to chronic infection. And boom, we're in the midst of the most devastating pandemic in 100 years, and the result of which a large portion of COVID patients developing chronic illness from their infection. So we had to uh, add a COVID chapter. We interviewed uh, lots of folks and learned a lot in, in writing it. And that's going to benefit my patients and hopefully it'll benefit the readers as well. And um, and we added it. It's, be, it's going to be part of the ebook. So when people purchase the ebook, it'll be in there. The audiobook I haven't heard if we met the deadline. And for the hard copy, for the first printing, it's available from the publisher, which is HMH, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, as a downloadable free PDF. And then for subsequent printings, it's going to be part of the actual part of the actual hard copy. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. So while we continue with our questions, I want to ask you one more thing. So th there are there is the comment stream that is going on here. I'm sure that you can look at them as well. A very common uh, message that I'm seeing is how can people reach you? So I had thought that I would ask you at the end about how do people reach you, but the way I'm seeing the comments, I'm going to uh, request you to tell us if people wanted to reach out to you, they wanted to contact you, talk about, let's say, Lyme or, or long COVID or other chronic diseases, what is the way to reach out to you? Well, we're on social media for the book. We have a, a dual social media platform on Facebook and Twitter. It's the chronic book, I believe, at uh, Facebook. And the website is thechronicbook.com. I think the Twitter site is Limebook and at Limebook. And my personal uh, Twitter is at Steve Phillips, MD. So, and then I'm in practice in Wilton, Connecticut. And that's where I've been for a really long time. Got it. So, uh, thank you very much. So what I'll do, do is, uh, Cool Bean, so this is actually on me that I did not have all those links. I did not request for those. So I promise you this, that I would get all those links. And by tomorrow, I will publish these links to Facebook, Twitter, and other uh, website uh, on Facebook and on our Twitter. And I would also post them as a small post on YouTube as well. So by tomorrow, you should be able to get access to all of them. One clarification over here, I have no financial or other interest with Dr. Phillips or his books. My basic bias, which has always been true, is, is it possible that during this horrible time, we can bring you more and more help? That is all. That is my gain if that mm -hmm. help is there. And that's about it. That's great. So, so thank you very much once again for telling us where we can find you. Continuing with our discussions, so I realize that there are many kinds of chronic diseases, especially the chronic infectious diseases. Tell me this, why are we struggling as a healthcare community? Why are we struggling with this? Why do we not have a good handle it? What are the kind of chronic diseases? So many questions, but, but why is this such a problem? Well, I don't mean to sound jaded, but you know, I think all doctors that are in practice for a while know that uh, medicine is led around in large part by pharmaceutical industry. There's no money in cures. I mean, if you look at Harvoni, the cure for hepatitis C, they've done, it's actually published articles about it, how bad of a business mistake it was, that it only made three billion or whatever. I'm just, you know, you know, paraphrase, I don't know exactly. But it didn't make enough money because it cures the pool of patients that are being treated. And I think that, um, I think that, you know, why would a pharmaceutical industry be willing and motivated to cure a chronic condition when instead they can have an annuity by suppressing symptoms for the lifetime of the patient? I really believe that, and I don't think there's money in cures. In the case of, let's say, somebody like my dad, I think it's a different story. You know, I don't think it's motivated by anything pharmaceutical. There was no pharmaceutical that could really help my dad. It was really heart transplant or no. And I just want to make people aware that, for example, they did a study, I think in 2015 or 2016, where they went into the hearts and actually did 
heart muscle biopsies of 110 patients with my dad's condition, which again was dilated cardiomyopathy, and they wanted to biopsy them to see if they had Lyme because we know the Lyme can do this. And they found Lyme DNA in 20% of these patients' hearts. And they made a point in the study to say that almost two thirds of the patients had negative Lyme tests and none of them had typical Lyme disease. None of them had Bell's palsy, none of them had arthritis, none of them had the stereotypes. So if you don't have a, a really, really high index of suspicion and knowledge base about what these infections can actually do to the body, you're gonna miss it. It's just gonna happen. Nobody goes and gets a heart transplant to diagnose Lyme. It's the most ridiculous thing. It just doesn't happen, except in, in a research setting. And you know, and then I, you know, you have to wonder, do the are the doctors who are giving these heart transplants, are they going in, are they doing this before their heart? I'm, I don't know. I'm not a cardiologist, but I can tell you that I went back to my rheumatologist when I got well, and I said, This is, you know, how I got better. This is my story. Will it impact on your treatment paradigms? And they're like, no, no, we're glad you got better, but no, you're a one-off. I'm like, really? I'm, I'm, I mean, you know, I'm not a one-off. Nature's not fickle. And that's what I think. Got it. So so then tell me this. Um, totally understood. And we are actually seeing the same issue happening with COVID as well. The long hauling states are being observed now. There is not much care there, there is not much attention there, and people are suffering. And my fear is that if we did not become attentive to it, this would just become an issue with the majority of the public around us because COVID is just going around everywhere. So, right. so tell me this, how should a patient approach all of this? So we, we understand that there is there are some interests on pharmaceutical side, there are some, uh, what I have seen is, so maybe I can say it more boldly, what I've seen is that doctors are just not educating themselves. They are not informing themselves. I even see cynicism in doctors to say, oh, man, this guy is just he's a, you know, he's a nutcase that he's talking. Right. How do we how does a patient navigate this situation? Um, I don't I don't have easy answers. I think that, you know, in the book, we tell patients they have to follow their own, you know, guiding voice, their their own kind of gut instincts. and it's, you know, we say, look, if a, if a doctor is being dismissive, is not listening to logical arguments, you know, logical concerns, then it's really time to find a new new doctor. I, um, I, I, I don't, I think I'm very in favor of patient rights, having been on both sides of the equation. You know, uh, it's, it's not like doctors are working at a deli counter and they should just give whatever the patient asks, but it's a team effort. You know, it's not like the doctor's on the pedestal and the patient's down here and you do exactly what I say and that's it. I mean, I think that there should be discussions and I think that it's very reasonable that if doctors are not educated on a certain topic, that patients can bring in studies and say, can we go over this together and see what you think? And I've had so many doctors uh, turn around based on uh, documents that I've written. I gave testimony at a bunch of um, state hearings and then at a national level at the IDSA hearing in 2009 in Washington, DC. And it was about, they asked me to write up the evidence at that time in 2009, the evidence that supported the chronicity of Lyme infection in patients with chronic Lyme, because it was so controversial. And I just started writing and I, I didn't stop writing until I was done with the evidence. And that was back in 2009, ended up being 81 pages long with 226 medical references. And that's what, what, that's what the data was in 2009. And, and now there's immeasurably much more. So the fact that they're still fighting about Lyme when there's such overwhelming data of its persistence, I mean, they've isolated Lyme bacteria from patients after literally years of antibiotics, it's published all over. And they're still fighting about it. So I, I'm feeling terrible for the COVID patients that are going through this now because they're getting, I think, uh, dismissed by lots of doctors. I think that it's a common theme that I've seen for years that patients come in with literally having medical trauma, PTSD from going through the system and going through what they're, it's basically, I think it's PTSD from betrayal. Their bodies have betrayed them. They're on this ride that they can't get off. And every day it's a new symptom. And again, I've been there, unfortunately. I wish I never went on that ride. And and also having doctors not believe them. I didn't go through that much part of it. I think because I was a doctor, uh, they didn't maybe at least it, not, not to my face. And the other thing is I had 
so many objective features. My joints were the size of like, you know, my knees were the size of cantaloupes. So nobody would doubt and tell me it was in my head like so many patients have gone through because I had things that doctors could all see. They could see my abnormal blood tests and my high fevers and everything else and my spleen being so large. So in terms of how to navigate, I think that number one, you find a smart, inquisitive, uh, respectful doctor that you're gonna have a partnership with. And then number two, they get the referrals to other smart, inquisitive doctors that you can have partnerships with. You need a, a village to get better from these things. It really takes a team. And if you find that there are a few doctors that you don't click with, that's it. It's okay. You don't have to click with everybody. We're not going to all get along with each other. And But the patients need support systems. And um, easier said than done, right? It's not always so so easy to find people you really click with, but that's what it takes. Got it. So then um, talking about Lyme, um, I know that Lyme has just become a, a go-to word for any chronic issue. But tell me this, and this is actually very uh, near and dear to my own heart as well, for my own patients and my own friends as well. When Lyme or Lyme-like situation has continued for decades, is it treatable? Is there still hope or people should? Because I see a lot of time when people come in and they say, I have had it for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. So I am a case that is not going to get well. What is the, is there hope? There's definitely hope. I mean, I see these types of patients on a regular basis. These are the patients that come to see me. In the book, we call it Lyme Plus because it's easier than listing Lyme plus 10 other infections. But even just Lyme, even just it within the one class of spirochetes, the spiral shaped bacteria, there are many non-Lyme Borrelia that do essentially the same thing that Lyme does. And people may not know about these. They don't test positive by Lyme antibody tests. Like in Connecticut, they have Borrelia burgdorferi, obviously, just like in the rest of the world. But we also have Borrelia miomotoi, another spiral shaped bacteria that's a very close cousin to Lyme that does not cross react with Lyme Western blots. And those people will not ever test CDC positive for Lyme. Um, the, uh, throughout the South, they have Borrelia bisseri. In the Midwest, they have Mayani. They have, in the further South, they have Borrelia lone starry. And around the world, they have other Borrelia that are not Lyme. And they have really tons and tons and tons of these Lyme-like illnesses. So it's like a rose band near the name. And that's just among the spirochetes. And then the other classes of organisms have similar things. Like for Bartonella, they consider that an emerging infectious disease. So before HIV came along, they only knew about two species of Bartonella. And one was Bacilliformis in South America in the high Andes Mountains. And that was it. If you didn't get to the Andes Mountains, there was like no way you can get, you know, Bartonella Bacilliformis. And then they had Quintana, trench fever, Bartonella Quintana. And that was it. And then HIV came along and the immune system started going badly. And then when they were you know, having a lot of immune suppressed people walking around, started noticing Bartonella in these patients only because of their poor immune systems. Otherwise, they've never been able to isolate the organisms. And, um, and that's how Bartonella kind of was discovered to be a, a ubiquitous organism. And since then, they've discovered 45 additional species and many of them infect humans. So who knows where it will end? I don't know if there'll be 200 or 250 or, or more. We just don't know. It's, it's really a it's kind of explosion of data for Bartonella. Got it. Got it. So, so the important takeaway here for, for those cool beans who've been suffering with the chronic diseases, um, maybe Lyme, maybe something else, and as Dr. Phillips calls it, Lyme Plus, that includes other situations as well. And and those friends of mine, those patients who have Lyme, please know that it is hope. Number one, number two, uh, I went over your book and I wanna show once again, sorry that uh, I am actually showing this again and again. I'm sure that you are happy about this, Dr. Phillips, but for my cool beans over here, look, this is not a big investment. Hardcover, $28, Kindle, $15, audio CD, $24.99. For yourself, for your friends, or for, for the folks around you, this is a treasure, this book. And I actually went over this book, and what I saw was 
down near the end of the book, there is a discussion about the remedy. And what I saw was, again, I was very curious about the um, chronic diseases. And what I saw was that it's not a very complicated um, process. I think what is complicated is trying to figure out what is really going on with the patient, then providing them a helping hand while they are going through the treatment. The treatment regimes th themselves are not really complex, but their durations and then during that time, the support is very important, but there is hope. So uh, my question, uh, Dr. Phillips, may that be Lyme or something else, we call it Lyme Plus. Um, I saw that the treatment, for example, the antibiotics used are not very complicated. Uh, what is really the issue when managing this these uh, conditions? Well, the so when I when I got better on let's say antibiotics X Y and Z because I don't I don't want to you know go down too many rabbit holes with just my story because it'll take up hours and hours because it's so complicated. But I was under this kind of biased view that aha my case was so hard to treat. Now every Bartonella patient that I see is going to respond to the same medicines that I responded to. And it's not the case. And, you know, so it's, unfortunately you can't cookbook these things precisely based on the diagnosis. You can get a general idea, but it's not like breast cancer, which is now very precision medicine oriented where they could tell exactly what kind of breast cancer to use and what kind of therapy and everything else. We don't have that luxury because these illnesses have been basically ignored by a large section of, of medical science. And in terms of the way that they need the attention to be, meaning we need to have better direct detection tests. There's no, you know, these are fastidious organisms. It means it's very, very hard to cultivate, very hard to culture from animals and people that have them. So in the case of, of Lyme, for example, it's almost impossible to grow from animals and people who have active Lyme. In animal studies, they inject the dogs with Lyme bacteria, and then they really can't grow anything even before the dog is treated. So in terms of uh, finding a specific therapy for patients, it, uh, it, it does boil down to a bit of trial and error. For example, you would think that minocycline, doxycycline, and tetracycline would work very similarly. I mean, they're such close cousins. Turns out in my experience in my patients, 95% of people respond better to tetracycline than they do to doxycycline. Minocycline I don't love because it has additional side effects that doxy and tetra don't have, like more irritation to the thyroid. You can see thyroiditis. Minocycline has actually been linked to thyroid cancer, even though it's known to be a safe antibiotic. It's just, it's not, it's just not one of my favorites. And for me, tetracycline didn't work at all. And it, it helps 95% of my patients. But doxycycline did. And that's just an example of the inherent var variability that you'll see between patients. So you have that trial and error going on. And then in my practice, I use a lot of non-antibiotic antimicrobials. Like people would be very surprised to hear that fluconazole, which is an antifungal, actually has number one activity against the Lyme bacteria, and number two activity against uh, Bartonella, and number three activity against leishmaniasis, you know, the tropical parasite, leishmania. So people tend to put these antimicrobials into these little boxes and say, this is an antibiotic, this is an antifungal, this is an antiparasitic. And when you think about just how intimately related life is on the planet, these labels become so silly. I mean, we're, we are 50% the same genes as a banana and 80% the same genes as a zebrafish, which is true then how different is a parasite from a fungus from a bacteria? So there's, they don't, the actions don't abut, they all kind of overlap, you know? And so in the case of fluconazole, for example, it's an azole, and there are other azoles that are tuned up to be antibiotics, like metronidazole has antiparasitic activity, but it's a known antibiotic. And then there are other azoles that are tuned up to be antiparasitics, like mabendazole and albendazole. And then other azoles that are tuned up to be antacids, like omeprazole. But even omeprazole has activity against leishma leishmania, leishmaniasis. So you don't even think that you're going to treat this tropical, hard to really hard to treat parasite and give someone uh, an ulcer medicine, and their parasite will will get better. But we use a lot. That's just a couple of examples. But we use a lot of non-antimicrobial 
it should be non-antibiotic antimicrobials to get people better because uh, when I was out, listen, all I did was lay in bed for two years, reading, reading, reading. So um, I'm very concerned about keeping my patients' microbiomes healthy. And you would think, oh, this guy prescribes antibiotics all day. He must have so much C. diff in his practice. We have almost none, almost zero, literally. And, uh, you know, the couple of cases that we've had over the last seven years, literally the couple of cases were in patients in whom the either had a special circumstance, like one person had inflammatory colitis really badly as an underlying, and those patients tend to get C. diff anyway, just spontaneously. And, um, and then another case, an infectious disease doctor asked me to take over a patient and treat her with uh, cephalosporin, which we don't use in the practice because of the high rates of C. diff. So we're very, very uh, concerned and careful about the microbiome. And you can use antimicrobial therapies that do not disturb it very much. And I just wanted to make that point clear because people tend to think that, oh, you're going to wreck the microbiome, you're going to do this. You know, the most boring part of my story that I don't even tell people, and I don't even know if it's in the book, is that I developed really bad GI symptoms when I got sick. And they got better with antimicrobials, not worse. I ended up having two upper endoscopies from double over abdominal pain. And, you know, this is a common feature too. I don't think there's any part of the body that's, um, you know, uh, it's not like there's a signpost that says don't enter the GI tract. It's just that when people get these infections in the GI tract, they get diagnosed with inflammatory colitis, duodenitis, gastritis, et cetera, or IBS. Got it. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the book. Thank you very much for your generosity with the time. If you are okay, uh, can we go over some of the questions that Cool Beans have on Absolutely. this thread over here? So Cool Beans, you've been writing questions for a long time, and many of them have scrolled up. If I can uh, please request you once more that if you have a question that, that is a burning question, you want to have that answered, we have uh, Dr. Phillips here, please type it again. I'm going to go through the questions as, as well to see which one I can find. Um, so let's start from Jenna Taylor. Uh, Jenna Taylor says, uh, talk about microbiology. Does he have thoughts or experience with breast implant illness, long hauler here, months nine, but was sick prior with unknown? I mean, obviously I've had some patients come in with this question, but I haven't had uh, a definitive answer to give them. Some of my patients have had their breast implants taken out or found to be leaky. Did those patients immediately feel better when they were taken out? It's a, it's a small minority to begin with when I've seen this happen. And I have not seen patients tell me, yes, I was miraculously better. I have heard of other doctors with patients who it has helped, but I haven't seen it personally. So I'm sorry that I don't have a lot to add on the, the, um, the question about breast implants causing you know, autoimmune uh, related illness. Got it. Thank you. So uh, continuing on, there is another question here, uh, Kathleen Kish. And this is the this is the um, tip of the iceberg here. So if you see here, the, her message is no one would believe me of my symptoms because I look normal on the outside, yet I'm deteriorating on the inside. And what I see is many doctors would just uh, put the things aside saying, well, do you have a psychological issue? What is how do we balance this with the science? Well, Kathleen, this is such an, this is this is probably the most common comment that we get. Uh, doctors don't believe me because I look normal on the outside. And with with Lyme, most patients do look normal on the outside most of the time. With other infections like Bartonella, it's 50-50. Some patients with Bartonella also don't develop objective features, meaning features that doctors can see. How do you balance that? I mean, you know, tongue in cheek, I tell my patients not to take a shower for a few days before seeing the doctor. Like, how do you get a doctor to believe you that you don't feel well? Um, I, I Like I said, at the end of the day, it's our job to believe the patient, right? Who's going to want to make this stuff up, really? Unless somebody has Munchausen's, which is exceedingly rare disorder, psychiatrically, right? It's so rare. And I saw one case during residency, literally one case, and his case was so rare that it was written up in a medical journal article, and that's how we diagnosed him because he'd been hospital to hospital. So, you know, if we're not going to be believing the patient, then we shouldn't be in this business. And that's what I strongly feel as part of patient rights and patient autonomy. Um, in terms of objective features, 
by the time patients have objective features, they're usually so sick. They're, you know, on the way to being wheelchair bound or what have you. I remember one time, just a, you know, interesting story because I, when I couldn't walk and I was starting to get better when I found answers, it was my goal to get a bag of lettuce at the local grocery store. And it was, the lettuce was all the way in the back, you know? So I used to drive there twice a day. And I, what my goal was to walk in without crutches and get the bag of lettuce and leave. And I had to turn around by where they put the shopping carts together, where they nest them at the beginning. And it was like a daily event for a few months. Then one day I got a bag of lettuce and I called everybody I know crying, I got a bag of lettuce, I got a bag of lettuce. And, and then shortly after that, I went to one of those big box stores like a Home Depot or a Lowe's and I parked in the handicap spot because on that day, I wasn't particularly feeling that great. And the handicap sticker, I didn't want to use it when I was starting to walk better. But on the days I was still bad, I used it because you know I was entitled. I was a handicapped person. I get out of the car and a lady comes up to me and says, yeah, you're handicapped. Yeah, right. And I stood in awe, like dumbfounded. And then she's walking away in a huff. And I yelled after, thank you, because I was so flattered. It was the first time that I didn't look handicapped in years, you know. And so, I don't know, just a little insight from two sides of the coin of having been there and looking handicapped and being happy now that I don't, and also realizing that most of my patients don't look like they have something's going on. And it's so frustrating because they end up being not believed and nobody wants to be disbelieved. It's like the worst thing when you realize that your doctor doesn't trust you. It's terrible. Be beautiful anecdotes. I actually read about this, uh, the letters part in your book as well. Very touching and, and what a ray of light as well for hope as well. Uh, question here, uh, Eric Dog says, I freeze ticks off first before removing them. Helps to minimize poison injected by ticks. Is that a correct Way. It's not the official thing. I don't, I, look, the free, I, I don't see ticks being, uh, unless you have a nitroglycerin kind of a spray. You know, I don't see them being quick frozen to the point before they can regurgitate their, their contents. You know, they always say, don't burn the ticks, don't put the ticks in Vaseline, don't, don't kill the tick because in the process of killing the tick, it could, it could vomit up its contents and it'll be worse. So I don't know that that would be proven to make it better. I think that they have these little mini crowbars now that they have. I don't know if you guys have seen them, but they are super effective and they're much better than tweezers. You just give a little bit of a, little twist and the tick pops right off. And I treat tick bites. There have been studies from Yale saying yay and nay to treat or not treat tick bites. But for the couple of weeks of doxycycline, if you get it right at the time of the tick bite, the odds are good that people are not gonna come down with chronic illness after that. And I figure taking two weeks of doxycycline versus uh, a potential lifetime of, or, or many years of chronic illness, which does happen to people uh, too often. I would rather offer my patients uh, treatment for tick bites, for sure. Makes sense. Jim Maddox says, uh, some doctors are using hydroxychloroquine for Lyme treatment. Have you used it? Yep. Hi, Jim. Uh, yes, I've used it extensively. I used to use it a lot more before I got sick. Uh, I think that it's been vilified in the press. You know, hydroxychloroquine, that actual combination, hydroxychloroquine and a macrolide was published as a treatment for chronic Lyme many years ago by Sam Danta, who's a now retired infectious disease doctor that I know well. And, um, you know, so we used it and no one had a cardiac problem. No one really talked about QT prolongation or, or anything bad about it. And it worked very well and it has worked very well for Lyme patients. The reason that I don't use it now, and it's been published um, to work for uh, Bartonella in case reports as well. Like, for example, they had a couple of very, very, um, really impressive case reports out of uh, South Korea where patients had uncontrollable fever, 103, 104 fever, and um, could not get their fever under control with IV vancomycin, IV sulfosporins, IV, doxy IV doxycycline. And then when they added hydroxychloroquine to doxy in one case and then minocycline in another case, and these are Bartonella culture positives, which is exceedingly rare. Like I said, these bacteria are so hard to isolate from the blood of these people have the illness. And um, and then the patients are able to leave the hospital fine. So we think it probably works for both. Uh, in the test tube has been documented to kill Lyme bacteria directly. And uh, 
So I have used it extensively. I don't use it very much anymore for my patients. And the reason is not because it's toxic or scary, in my view. The reason is because it has a really, really long half-life. And I try to do what I call uh, pulse therapy in a lot of patients, which I know is counterintuitive for a lot of people that think of antimicrobials, but it does uh, work. So when I first opened my practice, it was 1996, and I was treating the way that every other doctor that does what I do, um, how they treat, which is uh, straight through antimicrobial therapy. And it was taking, it was like watching grass grow. I would be treating patients for literally years with antibiotics, trying to get them better, and they would slowly get better. But we're talking four or five years, and I was like, there's gotta be a quicker way, this is ridiculous. So I'd read about some cases of pulse therapy for Lyme, and I started, I said, what have we got to lose really by doing a few rounds? And patients were improving quicker. And uh, so I'm not married to any one type of therapy or another, but there is a benefit in a large subsection of patients by doing this intermittent therapy. And we've cut down the treatment length from what used to be four or five years down to six to nine months of antimicrobials on average over about 12 to 18 months of time. And for me, I did it both ways. I did it straight through. I was so happy to walk again. I was just so excited to be mobile. There was no way I was going off treatment. So I stayed on three different antibiotics for a year. And then within days of going off, I was in the back of Restaurant Depot, surrounded by these giant cans of ketchup, because it's not like a restaurant supply store. And I was stuck in the ketchup aisle. And I was like, this is how they're gonna find me. It'll be in all the papers. Dr. Phillips stuck in the back of Restaurant Depot in the ketchup aisle. And I couldn't get out of there. My friend had to like, you know, over his shoulder help me out. And I was so despondent that I was off just for a couple of days. And I did the massive antibiotics for a whole year. So then I did intermittent rounds. And after the fourth time going off, that recurrence of symptoms didn't happen anymore. I was like, there's really something to this. You know, I knew pulse therapy was helpful, but just speaking now from a personal basis, it got me through this plateau. And so I do think that there are um, benefits to both. And people always worry, will bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? with intermittent therapy. You know, you have to think of these bacteria as the fast growing ones that everyone kind of thinks we understand like staph and strep and E. coli and whatnot. And then the weird old fastidious ones that nobody really understands. And these old slow growing bacteria, apart from mycobacteria that develop antibacterial resistance pretty readily, things like Lyme don't develop, you know, spirochetes don't develop antibiotic resistance well at all. Um, so. Got it. Couple of more uh, questions. One I just saw here. So if you give me one second. So here is an important question. Um, does Dr. Phillips treat people remotely, Melanie Goodman? Well, I, I, I started because of COVID. So we've been doing telemedicine since COVID, but we only do 10 states because of um, the different state rules. I keep, uh, I was starting with the California license and then I keep forgetting to do it. It's such a long thing. But yes, we treat, uh, the, the secretary knows, we treat, um, I don't know which 10, I forget which 10 states they are, but we're treating 10 states. Got it, thank you very much. Um, so once again, I'll, I'll promise to the cool beans here that by tomorrow, I would have all the information posted on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. So you can you can find Dr. Phil, uh, Phillips and, and connect with him. Um, So Flower says, I've had Lyme over a decade ago and no doxy treatment, very bad symptoms. I still have inflammation, mostly in teeth, Bell's palsy, two blocked arteries. Does it sound like possible Lyme to you? Thanks. Well, I mean, you know, just say like everything I say on this video, like in all those, I can't give specific medical advice, but I certainly want to inform and comment on general stuff. There's a big question mark about how much, I mean, I don't doubt that infections contribute to some degree to things like vascular injury and atherosclerotic disease. There's precedent for other infections. We know that with, with Bieberdorf, for example, with Lyme, it's been published that people can get coronary artery aneurysms. So if it can infect the coronary arteries and cause an aneurysm there, you know, what else does it cause? So it's been strongly correlated with dilated cardiomyopathy and it's been weakly correlated with coronary artery disease. So the, like in the studies, 
there was an increase, but it wasn't statistically significant. So with things like Bartonella, where it has to infect endothelium as part of its life cycle, I think bacteria like that and Coxiella, similar, those bacteria tend to produce more inflammatory markers, more vascular inflammation than Lyme does. And I do think that a lot of what's attributed to Lyme is actually mistakenly attributed to Lyme sometimes. Like if you look at the eye literature and uh, things like, let's say myoclonus, okay? Myoclonus is a movement disorder. It almost looks like a seizure in some patients, but the people are awake, they're not, you know. So that's been published to be happen, to happen from Lyme. In my patients, it's almost exclusively from Bartonella. So, you know, retinal involvement has been published to happen with Lyme. In my patients, the large majority, it's Bartonella. So, had, so why is it attributed to Lyme? Because they didn't know about Bartonella. You know, when many of these studies were, were written, Bartonella wasn't on anybody's radar. They weren't testing Lyme patients for these, what they call them, co-infections. But you have, to some, you have to wonder sometimes, which is the co-infection? You know, is Lyme really the chief infection or is Lyme the, the least of the problems that they have and something else is most of the problems? So in terms of dental inflammation, getting back to the question, in terms of coronary artery inflammation, um, I have seen both, you know, I've seen 20,000 patients. So I see a lot of everything eventually, like a lot of doctors have been in practice for a long time. I've had patients where I say, you know, tell me your story. And they go on to tell me this horrific story of a multi-system illness and most of their teeth fell out spontaneously. So I've heard that in a few patients and it is a, obviously a bizarre story, but I've heard it and I've seen it. And can I blame the infections? I can think that if there's vascular injury, that the teeth are going to die and that infections can induce vascular injury. We know that COVID is very adept, obviously, at inducing vascular injury. And, and whenever you're seeing the C-reactive proteins kind of going up in patients with chronic infections, you know, the vessels are becoming inflamed. So, Got it. So let's do this. We are about one hour, and I know that you're on the East Coast, and it's late. A couple of more questions, and then I would actually request the Cool Beans to go get the book. Again, I have no financial interest in this. I just think that this is a treasure of a book. And everybody, I actually, when I was reading this book, uh, Dr. Phillips, I was thinking that somewhere in high school, this kind of a book must be part of this syllabus so that people are aware how to get help when this kind of a thing happens to them or their friends or, or loved ones instead of suffering for a long time. Well, that so, is... Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, doctor. That is such high praise. And I, I hope some high schools listen are tuning in and listening because that is really very high praise. And I hope so too. I mean, if we can avert one person, 10 people, 100, 1,000 people from lifelong suffering, I, you know, I'm again, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I'm so moved by what you just said. It's very, very compelling and it resonates very much with me. Thank you. So thank you very much. So uh, one, uh, let's take a couple of more questions. Secondly, I would request the cool beans here. Uh, please get this book, read it, look at your own condition or any friends or um, loved ones nearby that you are concerned about. And then let's have another, as Dr. Phillips has offered his time, let's sit down again in a few days, let's say a month, and then talk even more deeply about these things. So a uh, couple of more questions. And then, uh, so one question here from, do, do, uh, from Anthony Karelikas. I heard only 30% of people present with rash from tick bite. Have you heard similar? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it is kind of similar. You know, the problem is that the rash, erythema migrans, is part of the reporting criteria to CDC. So a lot of the studies are terribly skewed. It's like asking what percentage of people in prison have committed a crime when committing a crime is entrance criteria to the prison. So you can't really look at studies that use it as entrance criteria and that's the problem. So if you look back at the initial, 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 back to 1975 when Lyme was first discovered before they didn't have any criteria and say what percentage of patients had a rash in their history it was from Dr. Steer's own published writings. It was 25%. So, and then if you look at patients with neurologic Lyme, you know, late stage Lyme, undiagnosed for years and years, then you see that they have histories, it's published 22%. But then you can say, well, that's a skewed sample because they're late stage Lyme and it would have found 
the rash, then they wouldn't have gotten a late stage. You know, they would have been treated early. So it's kind of a moving target. But I would say that I would go by the original kind of untarnished data from the very beginning when they weren't, there were no, there was, there was no bias, no skewing, no one way or the other. And that was 25%, which is pretty darn low. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. And uh, Cool Beans, thank you very much. As we're talking, some of you are actually buying the books right now as well. So thank you. Uh, again, the, the point of doing all this is how can we be healthy and how can people around us be healthy? And if we just keep doing it, I think we'll have a better, healthier society. Uh, one more question. There are tons of questions here. So you will have to come back, Dr. Phillips, once more to My have pleasure. a discussion. So let's take one more question. And again, uh, no offense to anyone. Whatever question is in front of me right now, I'm going to ask that. Love you all. And we'll ask your questions later on as well. Uh, so I had a question here that is about the ivermectin. So Jan Maslit says, ivermectin for Lyme? So that's a interesting. <laughs> it's a really great question. So we don't have evidence that iver ivermectin such got brought. Let me just cough, sorry. <clears throat> Ivermectin has got such broad activity in the body and it has some antibacterial activity, but to my knowledge, no one's uh, tested it against Bibidorfri or the other infections. I have a personal experience with Ivermectin. I have professional experience prescribing it for patients. And it's based on initially my personal experience that I'll share, which is not in the book. When I was getting sick, I was supposed to file for disability on June 15th. The doctor gave me Ivermectin uh, late May. And he's like, do you want to try it? And it was at the point where if he said, do you want to try whatever, candy canes on, with peanut butter as a cure? I'd be like, sure. You know, I would, anything he would give me, I would just take at that point because I was literally desperate. And he gave me a high dose of ivermectin, actually. It was um, 24 milligrams per day, believe it or not. So it was extremely high dose, 15 times higher dose than standard. And I flared up so badly on it that I had to be carried out of my office. And I was put to bed, essentially. And it was 11 days before my planned disability date, and I was bed bound after that. And I stayed on it for four months, thinking this is the biggest Herxheimer ever. I'm gonna get better from this, this is great. And four months later, I was horribly ill, and it never helped. And uh, I went off it, and I was very defeated. And then fast forward 15 months, or 18 months, whatever it was, of just abject suffering and multiple near-death experiences. And I started getting better when I found proper treatment which you know i was unfortunately had to had to do it myself and um i was like i'm gonna try ivermectin again i hate a mystery you know and that was a mystery and i don't understand it it was a hurt time or how come it never helped and i was given it again and i immediately felt fantastic and i had no flair and it didn't even seem like the same drug so i was like how could this drug that wrecked me so badly at the beginning make me feel so great now that I'm so much better. And I think that it's due to its immune potentiating activity. So immune potentiators will increase the strength of immune response when there's something to fight, but really don't do anything when there's nothing to fight. And they, so ivermectin gets rid of abnormal inflammation and it gets rid of abnormal immune suppression. People don't realize that these infections that are chronic induce different degrees of immune suppression. So bacterial infections that are chronic, call, they cause something called uh, energy. It's like energy beginning with an A. And it means specific immune suppression against each individual bacteria. Like tuberculosis sets up its own type of energy just against TB. And Bartonella does the same just against Bartonella. And ivermectin has this interesting quality um, where it reverses this immune dysfunction. So all of a sudden, the blanket is pulled away from these infections and the body goes haywire and sees them like in greater numbers than it did before. So it's a double-edged sword, the immune system. You know, if you make it stronger, you can, at the beginning of the illness, if you're behind the eight ball, you can make someone a lot, lot sicker. And once people are better, once I was better and I took ivermectin again, it's what we all want. We want, all want a nicely functioning, great immune system and to have less infection in us. And that's where I was at, at the end of it. So when I do treat patients, I have used it historically. Way before COVID came around, I was using ivermectin. It's so ironic that the majority of early COVID treatments are, are treatments that doctors like myself have been using 
for years. So I have lots of experience with ivermectin way before COVID. It's a super safe drug. The dangers are if someone's been to Africa, you know, there's a parasite called Loa Loa, which it causes a Herxheimer like reaction called a Mazzotti reaction, which can cause an encephalitis. So the first thing I do is ask patients that take ivermectin if they've ever been to Africa. And uh, if they have, I, I use great caution. We have to rule out Loa Loa in those patients because it could be asymptomatic infection, like so many things can be. But apart from that, ivermectin is exceedingly safe. And I've used it as an immune potentiator. So I've used it in combination with antibiotics. And it's like a one-two punch to, uh, to help, you know, strengthen the immune response on the one hand and remove the infection with antimicrobials on the other hand. Got it. Thank you very much. And uh, a quick story on the ivermectin uh, from me as well. So when the COVID started spreading, there was a... Um, there was a study that came out of uh, Australia about ivermectin in vitro being very useful. And then Dr. Shahid, uh, sorry, Dr. Alam in Bangladesh started using ivermectin with doxycycline. Right. In those days, I started looking up ivermectin as well. I used to use hydroxychloroquine at that time. So I started, number one, using uh, ivermectin for COVID. And number two, I started doing talks here. I think this was April, May timeframe. Since then, not only we have used, uh, me, I have used ivermectin successfully, it has been spreading. And fortunately, now there is a lot of uh, backing. Uh, there is Dr. Paul Merrick talking about it, Dr. Corey talking about it. But I'm, I'm kind of blessed that we were one of the first ones to start talking about it. One, uh, this comment I left on Serene Saf Sapphire's, uh, ladies, I'm in tears, blessed to be here. And my request to everyone, I feel blessed that we have Dr. Phillips here as well. I feel blessed that I could hear his experiences and his approach to these uh, debilitating diseases for which many people actually never try, they give up because even doctors are not very much informed. So my request to you is please, number one, buy the book and number two, even give it in gifts to other. And number two, please do share this video. I usually do say at the end of the video that please like, subscribe, and share. So that is more of a general thing that I do every time. But here, if you can really help, your help will be to share it with someone. Who knows someone who is suffering might listen to this and then have help and their life becomes better. So that is my message. Dr. Phillips, last words for you. Please tell us. Uh, any, yeah, like you're so well-spoken. <laughs> I wish I was half as well-spoken as you. But I just want to say that, uh, yeah, that resonated with me too, what you just said, because I remember I went to my primary care doctor a few years after I got better, and she just looked me up and down, and she was, she said, it was like after the appointment, she's talking about my cholesterol, you know, the whole thing, just regular visit, and she's saying goodbye, and she's like, wow, I never thought you'd get better. And it was like, bye. And, you know, just kind of like slipped out. It wasn't malicious. She wasn't trying to be nasty. It was just like, seriously, it's just a Freudian thing. I never thought you'd get better. See you later. And I walked out. I sat in my car and I realized that it was, if it was up to her, I would be in bed or dead, you know, one or the other. And for the rest, you know, that would, that would be it. And she didn't have any tools in her toolkit. So if this book empowers people, to have a healthier life if they can share it with their friends. I, I just, no one should suffer for what, 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 what Absolutely. my patients, what I've gone through, nobody. Absolutely. Yeah. So once again, thank you very much for your help, for the book, for the hope that you brought here. They say that when the student is ready, the teacher shows up here. <laughs> when the patient is ready, the, the healer shows up. So please use his advice. Please share this advice with others as well. Dr. Phillips, once again, thank you very much for being here. We are going to request you to come back once more with more questions and more interaction with the cool beans as well once we have read these books, your book. And so thank you very much for today. Thank you so much. Okay, bye now. Bye. Thank you, cool beans, for your time. And I would see you tomorrow.